19th century witnessed tremendous changes in Indian polity and society consequent to the expansion and consolidation of British imperialism in India. The most powerful and enduring effect of the British rule in India reflected itself in the intellectual development of the people on an entirely new line, which in turn brought changes in their political, social and religious outlook. The latter half of the 19th century was particularly characterized by the growing spirit of Indian nationalism which aimed at giving back to the nation its lost identity. Though the conflict between British interest and the Indian aspiration was not so obvious in the first half of the 19th century, in the early years of the latter half it became apparent, culminating in the rebellion of 1857. And in the last quarter of the century, Indian nationalism became self-conscious and assertive. It is a historical fact that Indian nationalism was the consequence of an awakening which was marked by momentous changes embracing various spheres of national life. It was a broad movement of regeneration affecting almost all spheres of life such as political, religious, economic, social, educational, and etc. It is popularly called Indian Renaissance or the Indian Resurgence. Bengal was the center of this awakening because it was in Bengal that British rule was first firmly established. Western education was introduced and a new economy was set up, leading to the birth of a middle class intelligentsia which was in the forefront of the awakening. In this video, I would briefly discuss about 19th century Renaissance in historical context and about them for whom Renaissance was possible. The appearance of the term Renaissance was connected with the beginning of Indian modernization, when Calcutta and other cities became the centers of economic, social and cultural activity of the new native elites in colonial Bengal. The idea of Renaissance had appeared in conversations and works by the first reformers from early 19th century. Known as father of modern India and father of the Bengal Renaissance, philosopher and reformer Raja Ram Mohan Roy had earlier realized the role of Bengal in advancement of cultural and social development of Indians. Ram Mohan's spiritual inheritors from Krishna Mohan Banerjee and Devendranath Tagore to Aurobindo Ghosh and Rabindranath Tagore call their time Renaissance or Regeneration. Phenomenologically, both the idea and the term are derived from inner experiences of the epoch makers, from their consciousness, reflections and mentality. The main reason for the new awakening was to pull out the men from medievalism, casteism, Partha and social evils to an age of development and illumination. At that time, in accordance with fatal socio-religious backdrop and with regard to the dead creativity, Renaissance came as a process of removing all those obstacles. Those decaying culture and tradition coupled with corruption and conservatism blocked the mental, physical health of the people of the society. To understand Renaissance, it is essential for one to know the factors which paved the way for the Renaissance. The awakening of India resulting in the reconstruction of the nation in socio-political and cultural field was the result of historical forces unleashed by colonialism. The first and foremost among these forces were the emergence of a new middle class. This class was constituted by a new class of zamindars created by the permanent settlement of 1793 and a new class of merchants who grew as a rich middleman in the East India Company's trade. This class played a decisive role in the social history of Bengal in the 19th century in the sense that the initiative for social reform came first from the educated section of this class. The emergence of this mid new middle class also created the atmosphere for the introduction and growth of English education, which proved to be an important factor leading to the Indian awakening. Further, 
This proved to be the most important step in the 19th century towards the formation of an educated middle class and an intelligentsia in the western sense of the term who played a leading role in the movements related to regeneration with the introduction of english as the medium of instruction it became the channel through which india discovered the liberal thought that was then transforming europe in this regard it would be unfair not to mention that in the making of the bengali mind receptive to new ideas like social reforms the activities of the sri rampur missionaries had done the groundwork in making bengal the cradle of indian awakening urbanization contributed much in fact the urban transformation of calcutta prepared the ground for this the city of calcutta held in the latter half of 19th century as the british jewel in the crown of british empire had in the beginning neither physical glamour nor cultural anestry until the 18th century calcutta was a cluster of villages inhabited by occupational group or caste the very face of it changed with the establishment of fort william the trade center of the east india company soon its population became strikingly heterogeneous it also developed the nexus of continental trade in cotton cloth with the growth of industries people belonging to all castes began to throng there either as agents or writers to foreign merchants or as just fortune seekers and thus it quickly expanded into a cosmopolitan city the restrictions of castes were eliminated here interdining and intermarriage became frequent along with this there took place an erosion of old values thus the city of calcutta did send ripples to the distant corner of bengal a new social mobility led to a new awakening the process of transformation in bengal was accelerated by the literary resurgence taking shape in the 30s and 40s of the 19th century literary creation does not take place in vacuum it is very often in response to social and cultural changes that literature originates literature can also act as an instrument or medium for effecting changes in social outlook the same is true of bengali literature which blossomed and enriched itself by drawing inspiration from indigenous and western sources as well a distinctive feature of the new literature which flourished under the impact of western learning was its humanism and rationalism and its infinite capacity to inspire the masses with patriotic feelings and national sentiments the entire 19th century particularly its first half was marked by ideological conflict cross currents and contradictions in different spheres of life there was a certain amount of inconsistency and hesitancy and this was reflected in bengali literature of the period however creative literature began with socio religious reformers of the 19th century an important point to be noted in connection with literary renaissance in bengal is that all pioneers of early bengali literature were active social reformers of outstanding moral stature The period witnessed the development of all branches of literature like poetry, novel and drama which helped in bringing attitudinal changes in society. It has been marked that the flowering of the renaissance began with the poetry of Madhusudan Datto, the drama of Dinabandhu Mitra and the novels of Bankim Chandra Chatterjee. In the words of historian Jodunath Sarkar, each of them reigned over one branch of literature. and turned it into a new channel where it has since flowed at his bidding thus the new literature which embodied the national spirit and aspirations was shaping the ideals of indian nationalism it may be added that not only the bengali literature but literature in other regional languages also developed similar trends in the 19th century and naturally served as a medium for promoting national consciousness among the indians 
political awakening in India was preceded by a cultural renaissance. The work of the Orientalists like William Jones, Max Muller and Monier Williams contributed much in bringing the cultural renaissance. Their increased interest in the study of India's past, her classical lore, resulted in the translation of many Sanskrit works into English and other foreign languages through which the world came to know of the cultural attainments of India. The socio-religious movements of the 19th century also had a decisive role. These movements were an expression of the rising national consciousness and spread of liberal ideas of the West among the Indian people. These movements, according to A. R. Desai, increasingly tended to have a national scope and program of reconstruction in the social and religious spheres. A deep analysis of these movements, however, revealed the fact that a major concern of them was religious reform. Yet, none of these movements was exclusively religious in character. Strongly humanist in inspiration, their attention was focused on worldly existence. Lastly, it must be noted that the 19th century for India was one of the great moments of cultural confrontation. Confrontation between modern scientific culture and a traditional culture. As the new education advanced, imitation of the West began to spread and very soon the traditional culture ceased to have any hold on the English educated generation. The proselytization of Christian missionaries who indulged in wholesale valification of Hindu religion further tended to weaken the hold of religion on the minds of the Western educated Hindu youth. Now, I would discuss the nature of Bengal Renaissance. The most notable feature of Bengal Renaissance was the revival of Oriental culture. Classical Bengali language and literature was analyzed rationally and developed, refined and refreshed by that movement. Rationality in religion was sought for. Apart from that, Bengal Renaissance emphasized over the recognition of dignity of individual. Freedom of the individual, liberty and emancipation of the women, thereby leading to the improvement of their condition, were also sought for through the movements and momentum. Other features of Bengal Renaissance was the acceptance of modern scientific attitude of the West, modern liberal views instead of medieval superstitions. Instead of ancient Sanskritic system of education, that movement gave due importance on Western science, philosophy, literature through the medium of English. Modern liberal and scientific education encompassing newness, freedom of opinions, view, idols were also urged historical perspective and Bengal renaissance through that moment. Simply, it could be said that a new momentum and a new direction to social, cultural and political sphere free from old value system was mainly the nature of that many-sided complex movements. Now we will briefly discuss about the Renaissance polymath, Raja Ram Mohan Roy. The first phase of Bengal Renaissance was led by none other than Raja Ram Mohan Roy, who by his far-sighted vision, zeal, compassion and efforts successfully led the movement and created the modern age at a time when it was of utmost importance. Historian R.C. Majumdar had rightly called Raja Ram Mohan Roy as one of the greatest representatives of the new age, and he reflected in himself many distinguished features that heralded the Renaissance in Bengal. Ram Mohan Roy, himself a versatile Orientalist, had fought earnestly for the introduction of more liberal and enlightened system of education, embracing mathematics, na natural philosophy, chemistry, anatomy with other useful branches of learning. Ram Mohun was a first internationalist and progressive modern thinker. As a reformer, he had perceived religion as the dominant ideology of the times and believed that it was not possible to undertake any social action without coming to grips with it. 
He also realized the needs of religious and social regeneration to precede the political regeneration which he gave expression in 1828. Raja Ram Mohan Roy's Renaissance movement emphasized over the dimension of rationality in religion, newness in education, and humanity in society by eradicating casteism and superstitions. He upheld the causes of monotheism and universalism in religion. He actually made a historical synthesis of all those threefold religion: Hinduism, Christianity, and Islam. His movement was based on rationality. Though his Renaissance movement, Raja Ram Mohan Roy stressed over the eradication of social oppressions, superstitions, ignorance and sectarian bias. He was opposed to caste system and for bringing people of different class, castes and communities under one roof of common worship. In 1828, he founded the Brahmo Samaj at Calcutta to propagate the monoesthetic doctrine. His Renaissance movement emphasized over common public good or locusrea. He was always vocal for individual rights, liberty and against inhumanity and superstitions. Ram Mohan's importance in modern Indian history rests upon the facts that he revived interest in the ethical principles of Vedanta school as a counterpoise to the western assault on Indian culture. and contributed to the popularization of the bengali language while at the same time he was the first indian to apply to the indian environment the fundamental social and political ideas from the american war of independence and the french revolution of 1789 raja ram mohan roy was the first indian to protest against the custom of sati In 1811 he witnessed his sister-in-law being sati. This experience had a tremendous effect on him and since then he concentrated on complaining against the practice of sati. He strictly opposed this system and advocated that this was completely against the women's right to live in the society as a human being. Finally in the year 1829 Lord William Bentinck banned sati by law thus Raja Ram Mohan Roy's efforts were fulfilled tremendous changes took place in Indian society and Hindu religion is being considered it can be considered as a turning point in the social history of India Raja Ram Mohan Roy's effort behind this rightly made him the able to assume the title as the father of Indian Renaissance Henry Louis Vivian de Rosio The establishment of the Hindu College in Bengal was an important event in the history of India a radical movement for the reform of Hindu society started here which is known as the Young Bengal Movement Its leader was Henry Vivian de Rosio, a teacher of the Hindu college. He was of mixed parentage. His father was Portuguese and his mother was an Indian. In 1826 at the age of 17, he joined the Hindu college as a teacher and taught there till his premature death in 1831. He was deeply influenced by the revolutionary ideas of liberty, equality and fraternity. He was a brilliant teacher. and in a very short period of time he made a huge followers he inspired his students to think rationally and freely to question the authority to love liberty equality and freedom and to worship truth the movement started by de rosio was called the young bengal movement and his followers were known as the de rosians they condemned religious rites and the rituals and pleaded for eradication of social levels female education and improvement in the condition of women devendranath tagore through his social and religious reforms devendranath tagore played an important role in the bengal renaissance together with friends influenced by ram mohan roy and under the tutelage from pandit ramchandra vidyabagish a leader of the brahmo sabha Devendranath founded the Tattvaranjini Sabha later renamed Tattvabodhini Sabha 
This influential society, which lasted until 1854, aspired to promote the purification of Hinduism, Adi Dharma, through the dissemination through philosophical enquiry and teaching of the Upanishads. For this purpose, Devendranath started publishing a journal, the Tattvabodhini Patrika, that had articles on the rationalization of Brahma doctrines and the propagation of natural theism, as well as on female education, widow remarriage, and the denouncing of polygamy. From 21st December 1843, Devendranath converted the society into a Brahma Samaj, Society of Brahma. a spiritual fraternity that came together for regularly praise and prayer this day is commemorated until today through the annual posh mela at shantiniketan in 1848 debendranath published a book based on selected passages from the upanishads and published it as a brahmo dharma through debendranath's effort the influence of brahmanism spread throughout india swami dayananda saraswati Swami Dayananda Saraswati founded Arya Samaj at Bombay in 1875. Arya Samaj movement was an outcome of the reaction to western influences. Arya Samaj rejected western ideas and sought to revive the ancient Vedic past. Swami Dayananda Saraswati was opposed to idolatry, ritual and priesthood. Arya Samaj under his guidance opposed child marriage, polygamy, casteism and the sati pratha. Some followers of Swami Dayanand later started a network of schools and colleges to impart education on western pattern. Arya Samaj criticized religious superstitions, supremacy of brahmins, polytheism and propagated the program of mass education. It also contributed to the Swaraj and Swadeshi movements. Dayanand Saraswati was first person who demanded Swaraj for the Indians. Leaders like Bal Gangadhar Tilak, Lala Lajpat Rai, Gopal Krishna Gokhale were deeply influenced by the principles and philosophy of Arya Samaj. Ishwachandra Vidyasagar, the leading light of Indian Renaissance. Vidyasagar, though born as Brahmin and versatile Sanskrit scholar, rather a colossus in Sanskritic studies, once made the most radical statement that sankha and vedanta were false systems of philosophy he emphasized the study of western philosophies which according to him evolved rationally as a result of interaction with the progress of science in our country with the advent of ram mohan we felt the first impact of secular humanism of europe he started up the renaissance movement in india through social reforms combining european bourgeois humanist thoughts ideals and concept with the essence of religion but the tenor of vidyasagar's thinking was absolutely secular he defined a very bold break at that to give a new orientation to the current of renaissance since ram mohan initiated religious reform It was Vidyasagar who freed the humanist movement as far as it was possible to do it in the Indian social condition from religious outlook and influence. His conduct, his entire life and works affirm this truth unequivocally. Thus the approach of these two stalwarts of the Indian Renaissance to socio-cultural reforms offer us a stimulating contrast. However the aim of both approaches was one and the same to free the indian society from the icy clutches of obscurantism and religious orthodoxy Madhusudan Datto the Milton of India Madhusudan became Christian Michael not because he was ritually attracted to the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth He thought rightly or wrongly that if he was converted to Christianity the religion of the then colonial rulers he would be able to shed the limitations of his orthodox hindu milieu however this religious disadventure did not stand in the way of his literary reincarnation the native ultimately returned to the ever warm lap of his mother in literature michael madhusudan datto was a maverick a person of independent and unorthodox view he was an iconoclastic poet who attacked the traditional concepts and principles in his own society 
He was a dynamic, erratic person and an original genius of a very high order. He was academically baptized in the Temple of Indian Renaissance, the Hindu College, later named Presidency College, Calcutta, in 1855. His contribution to the development of Bengali was spectacular and significant. The new sap of Western thought and feeling helped Bengali literature to put forth new leaves on every branch. His turbulent life amply illustrated the then 19th century British Bengal's intellectual and spiritual ambivalence. And so with his real thought somewhat erratic genius, he remained an alien star, a brief and brilliant wanderer into our literary firmament, according to J.C. Ghosh in his book Bengali Literature, 1948. It was Madhusudan Dotto who introduced Amritakshar, a form of blank verse with run-on lines and varied kasuras. He was the torchbearer of modern Indian intellect. The bridge he built in Bengali literature between the East and the West more than a century ago is well established today in all its glare and glory. On the death of Madhusudan in 1873, the editor Bankim Chandra wrote, If a traditionist proud European asks you who were the great Bengalis, we will say among the prophets Sri Chaitanya Dev, among the philosophers Raghunath and among the poets Sri Jayadev and Sri Madhusudan. Fly the national flag, insert the name Sri Madhusudan on it. Bengal is in mourning, in tears for the great poet of Bengal. Bonkim Chandra Chattopadhyay, Emperor of Bengali Literature Bonkim Chandra was not only the literary beacon of Bengal in the 19th century, but the inspiring soul of the revolutionary struggle for the liberation of India from the clutches of cultural, literal and political colonialism in British India. The lyrical song Bande Mataram, originally written in 1874, later included in his novel Ananda Mott, became the national anthem of the Indian National Congress. His epic Ananda Mott, set in the background of the Shonnashi Rebellion, when Bengal was facing a famine too, made Bankim Chandra Chattopadhyay an influential figure on the Bengali Renaissance, who kept the people of Bengal intellectually stimulated through his literary campaign. The novel became synonymous with India's struggle for freedom from the British. He also founded a monthly literary magazine, Bongo Darshan, in 1872, through which Bankim is credited with influencing the emergence of a Bengali identity and nationalism. Rabindranath Tagore Rabindranath Tagore is today more than a legend. He is, in fact, an intrinsic part of the very fabric of Bengali identity. Representative of the Bengali Renaissance and a creative genius who managed to powerfully connect diverse cultures into a formidable humanizing force. Throughout his long and fruitful life, he engaged himself in virtually every aspect of living and touched it with his own spirit of rejuvenation. Art, dance, literature, music, drama, education, rural development, social resurgence and a plethora of other areas were redefined by his contribution, making him as much a guiding star of Bengal as the creative voice of an entire nation tone and subdued as it was by the inclemency of the times. Sri Aurobindo, the prophet of Indian nationalism and renaissance. Sri Aurobindo was one of the most creative and significant figures in the history of the Indian renaissance and Indian nationalism. Roman Roland regarded him as the highest synthesis of the genius of the East and the West and the prince among the Indian thinkers. Dr. Radhakrishnan described Aurobindo as the most accomplished of modern Indian thinkers. Tagore painted him as the messiah of Indian culture and civilization. Siya Tash called Aurobindo as the poet of patriotism, prophet of nationalism, and the lover of humanity. 
Aurobindo was indeed a versatile genius, a great poet, a profound thinker, a notable metaphysician, a great seer, and an ardent patriot. His writings represent the crystallization of the new and rising soul of India and have a spiritual message for humanity. The contribution of Sri Aurobindo to the modern Indian political thought may conveniently be summarized under four headings. His concept of spiritual nationalism and divinity of motherland, his exposition of the ideal of complete freedom from foreign rule, his contribution to the theory of boycott and passive resistance, and finally his vision of high role that India was destined to play in world politics and his ideal of human unity. The bedrock of political philosophy of Aurobindo was his concept of spiritual nationalism and the divinity of the motherland. Aurobindo provided an element of spiritualism to nationalism. Now with this we move on to the spiritual message of the Renaissance. Sri Ramakrishna Paramhans Neither the early reform movements like Brahma Samaj and Arjo Samaj nor the later movements like the Prarthana Samaj and the Theosophical Society were yet successful in restoring India's national ideals and cultural integrity. Neither was there any definite sign of Indian regeneration. The nation needed not only a philosophy of action but also a man who could articulate such a philosophy. He was none other than Sri Ramakrishna, whom the French philosopher Romain Rolland introduced to the West as the Messiah of Bengal. Sri Ramakrishna appeared at a psychological moment in the history of India. The country was in a transitional phase, resulting from the conflict of rationalism and empiricism, which led to the never-ending controversies between the modern reformers and the traditionalists. His concept of religion was universal. Perhaps the most important contribution of Sri Ramakrishna and that which made him distinct from other social reformers of the time was his effort to bring all religions together in a golden bond of understanding and love. He showed the underlying unity behind the multiplicity of religions and proved the validity of each through direct perception and disciplined experiments. By highlighting identity and individuality of religion, Ramakrishna exposed the hollowness of religious conversion which was one of the serious challenges faced by Hinduism in those days. This also indicated his originality in thinking in regard to the question of Christian proselytism of the time. Narendranath Dotto, also known as Swami Vivekananda, charismatic disciple of the Hindu mystic Ramakrishna Paramhansadev, took the spiritual message of Indian Renaissance to the West. His message of human oneness, his immortal words, caught the imagination of people and made people think about themselves and about their role in the society. The Renaissance resulted in immense development in the field of science and technology. The edifice of modern education in science and technology was built during the first two decades of 19th century in the University of Calcutta. The main architect was Ashutosh Mukherjee. He struggled to develop science and technology through the university system of education. The Bengal Renaissance saw the emergence of pioneering Bengali scientists like Jagadish Chandra Bosch, Shottendranath Bose, Meghnath Shaha, P.C. Ray and others. At Ashutosh Mukherjee's initiative, young scholars like S.N. Bose, Meghnath Shaha were appointed lecturers in physics in 1914 to teach postgraduate students. This period was fertile so far as science and technology is concerned. According to A.K. Sen in his book, Sir J.C. Bose and Radio Science Microwave Symposium Digest, he mentions J.C. Bose was a polymath who contributed towards physics, chemistry, technology-based subjects and archaeology. He is one of the fathers of radio science and is also considered the author of Bengali science fictions. 
He was the first from the Indian subcontinent to get a pet US patent in 1904. Essen Bose was a physicist and specialized in mathematical physics. He is best known for his works on quantum mechanics in 1920s, providing the foundation for Bose-Einstein statistics and the theory of Bose-Einstein condensate. Upendranath Brahmachari was a noted Indian scientist and an able medical practitioner. Meghnath Shah was a well-known astrophysicist who founded the Shah equation that explained the physical and chemical condition in the star. He was nominated four times for Nobel Prize. P. C. Ray was a noted chemist who founded the Bengal Chemical and Pharmaceuticals in 1905. In the domain of art, the painters came out of the medieval tradition. They developed a distinctive style. Nature's inspiration and discoveries emerged as the new genre of painting during the entire phase of Bengal Renaissance. Abhinandanath Tagore was the herald of the movement. While he was accompanied by Gajendranath Tagore, Durga Shankar Bhattacharya, and Nandalal Bose. They took inspiration from the Mughal, Rajput and Ajanta paintings. The Bengal School of Painting and Academy of Fine Arts became the new institutes of art and exhibition. Although it was nothing if compared with the Italian Renaissance art which was a broad subject and took the art to the cusp of glory, but the Bengal painters gave the indigenous art a new meaning. There was no architectural splendor during this time in Bengal as we find in context of Europe. To sum up, Renaissance in Bengal or India was not cohesive in character. The young Bengal movement of De Rosio had its own dynamics. The Brahma Samaj movement of Ram Mohan had a different agenda. Bankim interpreted theology in his own way. Religious resurrection by Ramakrishna took a different direction. Vidya Sagar and Vivekananda took different roads to reform society. And all this hardly converged into a confluence of conciliation, cooperation and continuity. Universal enlightenment or real awakening of society as a whole remained a distant echo. The words of Rabindranath in his self-criticism reflects the same scenario. I know the incompleteness of my tune, my poetry, though went in diverse way, has not reached every heart and home. The Renaissance triggered the process of rediscovering India's glorious past after a long period of hibernation and initiated the symbiotic interaction between the best of the both, East and the West but always resisting her assimilation and absorption into ethos and culture of distant shores. The origin of many ideas of Western philosophy could be traced to the maxims of ancient Indian philosophy, such as Immanuel Kant's duty-based theory, supremacy of the motive of an action over the action itself and its consequences, the categorical imperative and the principle of universability. These all are reflections of the philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita written about 2600 years ago. Thank you.